Last Sunday, we concluded our series, Why Jesus Answers That Change Your Life. And what we saw in the course of the months tracking through that book was just how important our choices are. Our daily choices are truly determinative. They have, they have eternal implications to them. And one of the things that we have said, not only through that study, but consistently in our ministry here, in light of helping us all see the importance of our churches, uh, of our choices rather, is because our goal is to minimize the number of people who someday are going to have to stand before God Almighty and confess the fact that they spent their lives in the camp of the uncommitted. We want that day when we stand before God to be a good day. We want that day to be a happy day as we long for that, that happy place. And so what we are doing today and then in the weeks to follow is, is really refocusing on some very real essentials that really come back to understanding the importance of our choices. And so uh, today and next Sunday, we're going to be looking at uh, this matter of, of baptism, as we'll see, is a very real choice of discipleship. In fact, it's one of the very first choices that we make when we claim that we're a follower of Christ. And then after that, on the 9th of September, we're going to be beginning a series that continues to hitchhike off the importance of what we saw in the book of Revelation. And uh, this series is going to be entitled, uh, The Heart of Rescue, What Drives Those Who Care? Many of you have mentioned to me in the course of the sobering truths that we encountered there in Revelation. I mean, how can I be more, more passionate about uh, sharing my faith? What, what, what can I do? Well, we're going to be looking at what drives that heart that, that cares. And then even down the road, beginning on November 4th, which is going to be our Friendship Sunday again, an opportunity that we, that we take advantage of every year to invite folks to a uh, church that we're burdened for, that we want to uh, come to know Christ. We're going to have a month-long evangelistic series, and that's going to be uh, entitled uh, Help, or rather Hope When Life is Harsh. You know, nobody gets a go-free pass from having very difficult things on their lap that crash down on them like a bowling ball. And, and sometimes God uses those things to, uh, to awaken us to our need for him. And we're going to be uh, looking through a variety of selected psalms to, to help communicate the gospel for uh, those who need hope, who are hurting because life really is harsh. But today what we're doing in beginning to see the essential components of what it looks like uh, to be making decisions that matter is uh, this little study on why baptism matters. And I have to say at the outset, uh, this is not uh, original with me. I came across it a little while ago, and as I, I saw it, I said, boy, this is something that, that is really good. This is something that would profit all of us. And so I'm going to be sharing what I've uh, studied and learned from this resource and, uh, and adapted it uh, to meet uh, our need here. So let's look to our Heavenly Father as we begin this time together this morning. Father, um, as we've already been challenged this morning, uh, our walk with you can't be passive. It wasn't designed to be passive. You acted so that we can act. You took the initiative so that we can take the initiative in, in uh, making defining steps of, of pioneer faith to honor you. And so we pray that your spirit would, would once again, as he so wonderfully consistently does here, is to take your word, to drive it deep into our hearts, to cause us to see our need for compliance and obedience and surrender, and that indeed you might continue to be honored here as indeed we live out what it looks like to have you as the Lord of our lives. And so, Father, this is your church. We want you to be glorified in it, and we want your people here to experience your blessing and we pray that today would be of help to that end in jesus name amen well this has been a great summer of weddings hasn't it been i don't know if you've had the, 
the privilege to go to any or all of these uh, weddings. I've had the privilege to be able to attend them all. And they are all really just very special uh, times of, of celebration. And, and, and not only were they times of celebration and, and enjoyment, but uh, really they were, they were sacred moments. They were special, uh, defining moments. And in all of these uh, couples, we started out, I think it was back in May, with Anthony and Andrea getting married, and then Tony and Becca, and uh, then Cal and Kennedy, and just a couple of weeks ago, and fresh off their honeymoon, uh, we've got uh, Kayla and Colin. Uh, with us, and that's just been an exciting thing to to witness. And as as those of us who attended these uh, very special occasions, we walked away saying, you know, this was good, uh, this was right, uh, this was the way, this should be marked, because we need to mark significant events in our life uh, to treat those occasions that that are meaningful in a meaningful way. Things that mark the seasons of our life, the transitions of our life, uh, the milestones of our life. And whether it's a wedding or a funeral, a graduation or retirement, an inauguration or a birthday, there's something important about taking the time, making the effort to commemorate something. Well, it's fascinating as we look at the Bible that we discover that's true spiritually as well. And we're given those markers, those moments. In the New Testament, we, we call them ordinances. And an ordinance, in light of that word, is, is simply a, a prescribed religious act or a rite, a, something that the Bible tells us we need to do. An ordinance is something that, that is physical or tangible that signifies something sacred. And it has been uniquely authorized to signify that sacred thing. You see, it conveys the sacred to us. In fact, they're so unique that, that there are only two ordinances that have been accepted by all Christians down through biblical history. And, and one of them is baptism. And the other one is the Lord's table. And so we want to look at this this morning, and first of all, just by way of introduction, understand some important things about the background of, of baptism. And, and so today and next Sunday, I want to explain it to you as best as I can, and then I want to challenge you that, that baptism is, is not just a moving commemoration of faith. It's a, it's a just-do-it kind of moment. So let's jump in. Water has been used throughout history for, for religious ceremonies and, and rituals. And being immersed in it has been used as a way of symbolizing something of, of spiritual significance for centuries. In fact, that's exactly what the word means. The word baptize or baptism simply means to, to dip, to plunge, to immerse someone into water. But what's that mean? What, what's up with that? Well, in the Old Testament of the Bible, and if you're new to all of this, in the Old Testament, that's the first part of the Bible, uh, the part that talks about ancient Judaism. We see ritual immersion in water or baptism symbolize purification and the removal of sin. It symbolized that, that something had taken place that had cleansed you, purified you, washed you. But that's not all. It also served as a kind of initiation rite, representing that person being baptized had not only been cleansed, but had become cleansed through a change of status or a, a conversion of some sort. It's interesting as you look at archaeology that you discover these ancient Jewish um, um, baths that uh, were called mikvahs. And uh, we find them excavated in not only Jerusalem, but Jericho, all throughout Israel. And, and what they were, were they, they were this, this tub, you might say, and they had to hold at least 60 gallons of water in light of rabbinical law, and they had to be deep enough so that a person could be immersed in them. And so when you get to the New Testament, or the time of Christ, baptism, we discover, was still alive and well. 
In the New Testament story of Jesus, the person that we know is most associated with baptism is John. In fact, he was so associated with it that back then and even today, we still refer to him as, as John the Baptist. And, and we know that because he was known for baptizing people. He was a prophet from God who prepared the way for the coming of Jesus. And when he called people to open up their hearts to the coming of God, which he said was imminent, he taught them to mark that decision with a sacred act. And that sacred act was baptism. That was something new, because by that time, baptism had become all about ritual purity, something that only did something to you rather than something that reflected something about you. It had gotten away from being a symbol of something that had happened on the inside of your life as well and became something that you hung as an ornament on the outside of your life. This is what I did and therefore I'm okay. John's baptism went back to its original roots. His baptism was, was not about ritual purity, but inner purity. His was not about appearing clean, but being made clean from the inside out and baptism representing that transformation. But John knew that his baptism and all the baptisms that had preceded him were all looking forward to the baptism, the one baptism, the one that people could experience when the Messiah would come. And so this is how John himself uh, described it in Matthew, where he said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. You see, what John was saying here was this. God is coming to planet Earth, and you need to be ready. My baptism is to get you ready. His baptism, though, is the one that counts. Mine is just to get ready, you ready for his. Well, then God did come in the person of Jesus. And he gave baptism his seal of approval by submitting to it as well. And that even blew John away because Jesus was the one person in all of history, as you know, that didn't need to be baptized. He was the Messiah whose baptism John was getting people ready for. And so know what happened here. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. Now think about this for a minute. Here was Jesus, who didn't need to be baptized to mark an entrance into anything or to represent the beginning of a relationship with God. He was God himself in human form on planet Earth. But he did it anyway. Why? His intent was to live the model life. And he wanted to make sure that everyone knew just how important it was. Jesus would later say to follow his example in everything. And he wanted to make sure that he set the example with baptism. But then he did something else. He instituted the once for all final baptism that Christ followers practice to this day. His baptism. This is what he said. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. You see, baptism was something that Jesus intended to serve as a unique sign that marked those who had entered into a relationship with him. And it is full of symbolism. Everything about baptism is, is so symbolic. 
You know, you go down, reflecting Christ's death. You go under the water, reflecting his burial. I hold you under the water for three days. <laughs> and then you come up out of the water, representing his resurrection and how you have been raised to new life. It's an ancient tradition to symbolize the purity, the new life, the forgiveness that baptism represents. And so in light of that background, let's look at three reasons here this morning why it matters. Why does it matter? Why is this what God asks? Well, the first thing that we see here is why does it matter? Because it's a matter of obedience. Why did Jesus put so much effort into making sure his followers knew to be baptized? First, simply because it's a direct ask of Jesus to go public for him, to acknowledge him. Look at these words from Jesus himself. If anyone acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will openly acknowledge him. I will openly acknowledge that person before my Father in heaven. But if anyone denies me here on earth, I will deny that person before my Father in heaven. You see, Jesus has everyone who comes to him to go public for him. Well, how do you do that? That's the question. Well, he said, here's how you do it. I want you to do it through baptism. That's what baptism is all about. It's all about going public for Jesus. It's the way Jesus asked us to own our relationship with him before others. It's when we stand up and are counted. It's saying, I'm not ashamed of Christ. I'm not saying I have my act together or that I'm better than anyone else, but I have moved from one camp to another. I have moved and I have trusted in Jesus as my forgiver and as my leader. It's when you declare to the world, this is who I am, this is who I follow, this is what I believe. It's when you publicly acknowledge Jesus in your community on earth. And if you've come to Christ as your forgiver, as your leader, if you've given your heart and your life to him, if you've crossed that line, then this is a direct ask from Jesus. It, it's a just do it moment. And to refuse to do it would be to deny him. Essentially, if you say you've come to Christ as a leader and as his forgiver, and you refuse to get baptized, it's a public denial of him. I wish I could pull that punch, but I can't. You're publicly denying him. And in terms of, of Christian history, the first followers of Jesus got that message loud and clear. From day one, every person who became a Christian was baptized. There was not a single deviation from that pattern. Nobody even thought of coming to Christ as their forgiver and leader and then skipping over upon entering the waters. It would have been unthinkable and a direct act of disobedience against the Savior they said they believed in and wanted to follow because it really was a direct and a specific ask. And that's not the only reason, but if that was reason the only reason we had it would be reason enough. And there's a couple more reasons, but that should be reason enough. Jesus asked me to do it, so I'm going to get it done. Well, why else does it matter? Well, it not only matters because it's a statement of obedience, but it also matters because it's a very real testimony. It is a God-filled moment. It stands for something in the eyes of God and the world. It isn't just something that, that God marks in heaven, but it's something that you are able to mark here on earth. We mark births with celebrations and then birthdays. We mark graduations with commencements. We mark marriages with weddings and then anniversaries. We mark deaths with funerals. And we need to mark our lives. 
It's what set things apart. It elevates the important over the trivial, and it identifies the various seasons of our life. It links a passage in our life with an indelible memory, allowing us to carry it forward from that point on. The most important event in a human life is that moment when they come to Christ and have their entire eternity altered. And there is nothing more pivotal to mark that time and why one of only two ordinances of God given to us is to be able to mark it. Baptism marks it. It's a rite of initiation, a way of marking your entrance into a faith relationship with Christ. It is meant to reflect what has happened to you spiritually when you turn to Christ with your heart and soul, with the water reflecting the washing away of your sins and the new life that came into being as a result. Not as a symbol that you're perfect. We're going to be able to live sin-free from that point on. But as a symbol of what coming to Christ is all about, which is admitting that you do need to be forgiven, that you have screwed up, and that God has, through Christ, forgiven you of all your sin. And that you'll be able to keep drinking from that well of grace that the gift you so desperately needed was given to you. You see, it's your testimony that you've accepted that gift. Third, why does this matter? It matters not only because it's a mark of obedience and that it's a testimony, but what we discover it matters because it's a life test. You know, the older I get and the more I walk through the scriptures, the more I see that there are a handful of, of uh, very real life tests that God throws out there to see whether or not we'll pass. And it's the test to see whether or not your relationship with him has teeth. It's a test to see if you're willing to be, and I'm going to use a few terms here that, that are not always the terms that we like to hear, but, but it's a test to see whether or not we will obey. We will submit. We will follow. If you do, it sets your spiritual life in motion. It sets a course for your destiny. If you fail this life test, the one right at the beginning, then, then what kind of spiritual life are you going to have? I mean, what kind of spiritual life will you have if you say no to the very first thing that Jesus asks of you? What kind of a relationship is that? You come to him and then immediately functionally deny him? You come to him to secure your eternity and then refuse publicly to admit the relationship? You come to Christ and then your first act is direct disobedience and disavowal? This is huge, folks. In, in ways that we can't imagine. This sets the stage for your entire relationship with Christ. It's almost as, as if right at the beginning, Jesus gives a litmus test to see if you're serious about your commitment or not. They're pretty serious about their commitment. Sorry, Colin Kay, I didn't ask your permission on that one, but... You put it on Facebook, so I stole it. <laughs> you know, they, they, they just got back from, from their honeymoon. Went to Mexico, right? Great time, huh? Super. Uh, you go to any places to eat while you're out there? What was your favorite meal? Oh, okay, okay. So you probably went to a restaurant, right? Yeah, went to a restaurant, you walked in there, and, and here's what I bet... He, I, here's what I bet Colin didn't do. You know, honey, I, I, really, I really love you, but, 
would you please sit on that table on the other side of the restaurant? Yeah. And then peek over at the, over the menu and wave and so forth and wink at her? No. I highly doubt that, that you know, he said, honey, you know, I, I, I really love you, but would you please walk 25 feet behind me? Yeah. No. Unashamed commitment. Boom. Right there. You know, unfortunately, though, there are a lot of professing believers who say, oh, yes, I love Jesus, but Jesus, would you please sit over there on the other side of the restaurant on that table over there? Hey, w yes, I, I, I love you, Jesus, would, would, but would you please just walk on the other side of the street? See, that's what we functionally do when we refuse this aspect of what it means to own our relationship with him unapologetic love for him. Well, so who should be baptized? Everyone who believes. Everyone who has entered a relationship with Jesus. A and so many of you have done that. For the first time, many of you have done that right here at Grace. You, you, you prayed a prayer and you asked Jesus Christ to forgive you of your sins and to make you one of his children. You crossed the line and you made a decision. You've moved from one camp to another. But you've never acknowledged it before others the way Jesus has asked you to do it. Never. Others of you have entered into a relationship with Jesus months, even, even years ago, and you've never done this. Now, next week, we're going to just continue to pick up this topic, and we're going to be looking at a specific occasion where, where there's a lot of people who were baptized as an infant, but they've never been baptized as, as an adult, symbolizing the choices that you've made since then. What, what does that mean for you? And, and we'll get to that next week. But so many of you even here this morning just need to do this. In fact, that's exactly what the Bible teaches. Take a look at this verse from Acts chapter 22, and this is a transliteration of that verse, where it says, so what are you waiting for? Get up and get yourself baptized. You've been scrubbed clean of those sins and, and personally acquainted with God. And that's my unashamed challenge to you this morning. Right now, we're, we're offering baptism as an opportunity for, for people to go public with their faith through the learning curve that we have with our Let's Get Acquainted class. As I've been saying, it's, it's a way that we have to on-ramp people to this act of obedience. And I felt so strongly about this season coming up that, that I thought, man, we need this teaching today because eternity is coming and revelation has done something to me in light of at 62 years of, all, of, of age, my time is limited and I don't know how much time I have in effectiveness in this capacity here, but while I am able to do it, I'm going to be all about impressing upon people the eternal nature of the importance of the determinative decisions that they are making. And this first step is one such step that, that we can't minimize because the Bible doesn't minimize it and Jesus doesn't minimize it. And it's exciting to see a variety of people have already been signing up for this special class. So, if you're still struggling with this a bit, here, I want to ask you the simple question to ask yourself. Why? Just take some time and be ruthlessly honest with yourself. Why would you not do something that Jesus has asked you to do? Isn't his ask enough? What I want to do is just tell you a story from the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. And here's the setting of this story. There's this guy by the name of Nahum. A very important guy at his time. He, he was the commander of the king's army. He was a, a, a legendary warrior. But he had one problem. He had contracted the most serious disease of that day, leprosy. 
And so one of his servants came to him because he heard about this prophet who just might be able to heal him. And he told him to go to that prophet who went by the name of Elisha. And so Nahum went to Elijah. Let's track the story here. So Nahum went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to say to him, go wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Nahum went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Nahum's servant went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times as the man of God told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Now, there's a lot to the story here, but I just want to focus on, on one thing. Nahum came to God to receive what he could only get from God. That was healing and wholeness and cleansing. Just like many of you have. And then he was told to go and essentially baptize himself in the water. And he didn't want to do it. He didn't want to get wet. And if he was going to get wet, he was going to do it his way, on his terms, on his turf. But then did you notice the words of the servant there? Verse 13, the servant said, If God had asked you to do something incredible, valiant, heroic, sacrificial, would it have been appropriate? Would it have been worth a cure to your leprosy? And Nam knew the answer. Of course it would. Then the servant said, All he's asked you to do is this one thing. Get what? This one small thing. How can you not do it for all that you'll receive in return? So he did it, and he was cured. Now think about you and baptism. You have come to Christ to receive forgiveness for every sin you have committed. You have been given the gift of eternal life in heaven. You have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit for life change and transformation, strength and peace, enablement and power. It's all yours. Your marriage has been transformed. Your family has been strengthened. Your kids have a new mom or a new dad, and just your whole world is better. And Jesus could have asked anything of you, anything, and it would have been worth it. It would have been a, a rightful claim on your life. And all he's asked for you to do is to go down into the water, come back up, and grab a towel. And so many of you here have done that, and I'm so grateful. We, we are so proud of those individuals who have seized this moment in time, who have come through this learning curve and have done it. And, and they, have, they have done it even knowing that it was awkward for them. What? Give a testimony? Well, that's what baptism is. We'll help you walk through that. We'll help you do that. We'll coach you through it. Well, I've never done this before, but okay, I'll do that. Submitted. Done it. Blessed. I mean, everything in my whole past about what my parents believed and, and the tradition that I was raised in, it's, it's all so different than what's taught in the Bible. And man, and, and yet, 
you did it. It was a, it was a just do it moment, and you did it because Jesus asked you to do it. And I'm not the only one who's smiling. My smile's not important. Your Father in heaven is smiling. It was a milestone moment marked in heaven when you did it because he understood you did it for him, which made it so special in being that defining step of faith in setting the course of your spiritual journey. Let's pray. Father, we just ask that, that you might be very active in our midst here during this season, that we would just not be passive and think, oh, wow, how about that? But God, we would do the defining steps of faith that we need to do in moving forward for you. And so God, we pray for your effectual work in transforming us and conforming us to having soft and pliable and obedient hearts desirous of glorifying you and honoring you and giving testimony for your great grace in our lives. We look forward to seeing what you're going to do in the days ahead through obedient response from your people to the word that your scriptures teach us that we've heard today. And we pray this in Jesus' great name and his great cause. Amen.